Coming up on Locked On Dodgers, the Dodgers made a big trade, not the trade we were expecting. We expected Michael Bush to get traded, didn't necessarily expect it to be for prospects, but it was. And we have prospect expert Lindsey Crosby here from Locked On MLB Prospects to talk about the trade and talk about the Dodgers farm system in general. And that's what's on tap. So let's get Locked On Dodgers. You are Locked On Dodgers, your daily Los Angeles Dodgers podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, Dodger fans, this is Locked On Dodgers, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Thank you for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. Remember, this show is free and available on all podcast platforms and on YouTube simply by searching for Locked On Dodgers. And you can become an everydayer like us. All you got to do is subscribe wherever you're watching or listening right now. My name is Jeff Snyder. My normal co-host is Vince Samperio. Although Vince isn't with me today, I will introduce you in a second to my temporary co-host for the day. Uh, but Vince and I are both lifelong Dodger fans, just like a lot of you. We've also both spent time covering the Dodgers in the press box and the locker room, so we're not quite insiders, but we bring you the smart fans' perspective on our boys in blue every weekday morning. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On for $20 off your first purchase. And with that said, I am going to bring in our guest for today, if I can remember how to do this. One of the things that I like about having uh, Vince here when I'm hosting is that Vince is pushing all the buttons, but I got to host and push buttons, but here I am pushing buttons. And there is Lindsay Crosby from Locked On MLB Prospects. Lindsay, how are you? Uh, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited to talk to, uh, to everybody out in LA. Yeah, and, absolutely. And Japan probably too. You know what? It, we are we are definitely a global brand these days. And uh, <laughs> you know, probably won't talk, talk about many Japanese players today because uh, I, I guess Yoshinobu Yamamoto is technically, I, I don't know, he's eligible for rookie of the year. I don't know if he, uh, will anybody put him on any prospect lists? It is down to their individual definitions. Baseball America said they weren't going to do it this year. I think MLB Pipeline is. And the thing I'm trying to find out is what happens with the prospect promotion incentive because of the different placement of the list. I don't yeah. think he'll get you one if he wins. Yeah, that that's too bad because yeah, that would be uh he, he seems that, like he be might nice. be up for some awards, you know? <laughs> so but we are gonna talk about some 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 people that everybody agrees are either prospects or prospect eligible at least. And uh you know one of those was Michael Bush. Michael Bush has been with the Dodgers uh since they drafted him in what was that 2019, I believe. Um, yes, th these I'd are the I'd things you should like look up first, Jeff, before you start talking. Um, I know it's the same, the same draft that Cody Hosey was drafted because I got Michael Bush and Cody Hosey mixed up a lot for a while. 31st overall in 2019. I had to think for a second. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and, and Bush obviously tore it up in AAA last year, got uh, a couple shots with the Dodgers. Didn't do much there, but we we've talked a lot this off season about the fact that Michael Bush is a major leaguer. There is mm -hmm. nothing else for him to do in the minor leagues. He's 26 years old. He dominated triple a, he needs to play in the big leagues next year. And there wasn't really going to be a place for him to do that in Los Angeles. And so we knew he was going to get traded. Lindsay, were you surprised that he got traded for prospects and not headlining a deal for, you know, a, a, an established big leaguer? I honestly thought it was going to be some sort of carbon burns, Willie Adamas return for Michael Bush and Gavin Lux and some, you know, and two pitchers. But I think if you were going to get prospects, it makes sense the way you did it as far as getting guys who were not on the 40 man roster, giving you some flexibility there. And then somebody with a really high ceiling in Jackson Ferris. Yeah. The, the, you know, the key element, we knew something was coming just because the Dodgers needed a 40 man spot so they can make official the signing of Teoscar Hernandez. Mm -hmm. uh, and so they did that. And, and it was funny how the news trickled out. First, we heard Dodgers are trading Yancy Almonte to the Cubs and you're like, Oh, there's our 40 man roster spot. You know, we'll, we'll see. It's probably some minor league we've never heard of, you know? And then it was probably 15, 20 minutes later. Oh, by the way, also Michael Bush is going to, and uh, you know, oh, talk about burying the lead. But uh, it, you know, let, let's talk about Jackson Ferris and, uh, sorry, what's the other guy's name? Zahir Hope. Zahir Hope. Zahir uh, Hope. And, and uh, Jackson Ferris is a left-handed pitcher. And, you know, I was talking to you earlier today about what he brings. And I threw out to you, I saw a tweet from Jim Callis saying that, that Jackson Ferris could eventually be the top left-handed pitching prospect in, in the minor leagues. 
Uh, and you said there's potential for that, but there's a lot that needs to happen for that to, to come to pass. Yeah. So the thing to know about Jackson Ferris is he's kind of, he's similar to a lot of these very, very young prep drafty pitchers where there's a lot to like, there's a lot he has to work on. And when you look at the whole package, like I see where Jim Cowles is coming from and Jim Cowles, friend of the show, we have him on actually on next Monday's episode. Uh, the individual tools are really good for Jackson Ferris. The, the fastball, the velocity isn't where you would think a number one pitcher's velocity would be. But again, he's 19 years old. It sits low to mid nineties, right? He can touch 93, 94 with it, but all of the weapons with it, he has a curveball, a vertical breaking curveball that looks very, very much like the fastball until it gets halfway to the plate and it just drops off the table. He added in season, he added a sweeper, which is really unusual to see a young pitcher pick up a, a hard to throw pitch during comp live competition, but he added a sweeper and then he has a change up just like every good lefty pitcher should have. And so he's got four weapons that all move different directions, all sit in different velocity bands. And so like the package right there is like, that is everything that you would want a number one pitching prospect in baseball to have. And it's just, can you get them more consistent? Can you get more velocity on them? Can you land them for strikes more often? That's what you have to work on. But the raw tools are there, and it's very rare you can take any left-handed pitcher, never mind a 19-year-old, and say, yes, there's four pitches there that all do different things at different speeds that he can throw in any situation. So the raw tools are there, and then you just have to develop it, which fortunately, this organization can develop pitching. So I feel I feel good about it. Do the Dodgers have some experience developing pitching? <laughs> yeah, it's like once or twice, you know. Yeah, we're going to talk a lot about that later in this episode about some of the other guys they've developed. Uh, and and uh, Hope is, from what I read, he was actually a, a two-way player and there was questions about whether he's going to be drafted as a hitter or a pitcher. Um, I saw somebody else say that he was – uh, you know, first or second round talent drafted later down in, in the draft and, you know, paid over slot to, to skip college. Uh, what should we be excited about, about him? Yeah. Those, those prep draftees that go in the 11th round, that's always something where they're really talented. We don't know if they'll sign or not. And if they don't sign in the 11th round, you don't lose anything if they don't sign Uh so he didn't play a ton, right? He got in a couple games at the complex, but he looked like it's, it's both power and speed. And this is that really toolsy prep outfielder profile that goes bad for so many teams, right? A guy that is fast, that has raw power, but still has a lot of development to do as far as adjusting to professional pitching. Again, this is an organization that's been able to develop hitters. And so you feel like the risk to the Dodgers is less than to a typical team trying to take this very risky profile of a fast, uh, strong kid that is a little bit raw when it comes to baseball and building them into a major leaguer. Um, it's If everything went right, I could see him by the end of 2024 being in the back half of the top 10 of the Dodgers system. Like that's, he's one of those type of lottery tickets. I could also see him being out of baseball in four years. Like that's the Jaron Kendall route. Yes, that's the type of high risk uh, player that Zahir Hope is, but the ceiling is so high if you can work it out. And thankfully, this is an organization that has a good track record of being able to take those tools and get the best version of the player with those tools. So, uh, you know, I, I saw some Cubs fans on social media kind of upset that that thought this was a big price to pay for Michael Bush. Uh, and I saw some Dodger fans like upset that, wait, we didn't even get a major leaguer for Michael Bush. <laughs> Maybe if both sides are upset, it means that it's a relatively uh, even trade. This was one of my more favorite trades of this offseason as far as I feel like each team got something of value that fits them really well. Because the Dodgers, like, and you said it when you, we just opened this up, they didn't have room to go get two major leaguers on the 40-man roster. And so making this trade, getting the an 18-year-old and a 19-year-old that you've got four or five years before they go in the 40 man roster. That was the best way to do it. And if you're going to go out to get players that early in their professional careers, 
go get guys with really, really good tools that could really be something if they work out. And that's, it's a second round pick and an 11th round pick, but the money that Zaheer Hope got was the equivalent of a fifth round pick. So in essence, you got a second and a fifth round pick from last year's draft is what you got. And with how low the Dodgers always draft, uh, you know, it's one of the ways that you do replenish the farm system is by making these smart trades. We've seen, you know, we're going to talk later about River Ryan. They got him for Matt Beatty. They mm -hmm. got Nick Frosso for who? Mitch White, I think. Um, I get all these trades mixed up that, you know, <laughs> these guys who ha didn't really have a place on the Dodgers, hey, give us some prospects and we'll turn them into even better prospects. So, you know, fingers crossed that this ends up being that way. We're going to come back in a second. We're going to talk about Andy Pajes and a few other Dodgers prospects, the catchers, all of that. So uh, please keep it locked on Dodgers. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Look, buying tickets can be really, really stressful, whether you're going to a, a baseball game, a basketball game, a concert, a comedy show. It, it's, it's so hard to find the best price. Guess what? It's not hard anymore because the best price is always going to be on Game Time. How do you know that? Because they guarantee it. If you find a better price, tickets in the same section and row for less, they will not only refund you the difference, they'll give you a 10% bonus on that. 110% of the difference, boom, you get that back. I've put that to the test. When I was buying tickets to see Nate Bergazzi in Salt Lake City, uh, I checked all of the secondary sites. And guess what? Game time had by far the best price. I didn't have to use their best price guarantee because they just gave me the best price. That's how you guarantee that is you just make sure you have the best price. So whatever you're looking for tickets for, Game Time is the way to do it. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Just download the Game Time app and create an account and use code Locked On for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. I'll tell you what, man, pushing buttons and reading ads, it is not for the faint of heart, but here we are. We are back to talk more about the Dodgers prospects. And uh, I don't know. Did, first of all, I guess, Lindsay, I'll ask you, did we, did we miss any key points on this trade? You think we, we beat that thing to death pretty well? Uh, for the most part, I think we covered everything. The one thing that I, I, I want to still throw out to her too is on, um, on Jackson Ferris, some of the work that needs to be done is biomechanical work, right? Getting in there, streamlining the delivery, cleaning up all of the extra movement. And that's something where I think LA is going to be able to do a better job of that than anybody else probably could have with the exception of maybe Tampa Bay and maybe Wake Forest University in their pitching lab. So uh, some of the work is just things that this organization already does. But the good thing is he doesn't have to be given a pitch. That's one of the things I feel like delays some of the pitchers in this system is you're giving them pitches and you don't have to give him a pitch. He's got all four already. So should be able to move rather quickly as long as he can acclimate to the professional schedule and the move. Let's just hone in the command and get that fastball up to 96 and, and <laughs> get him to the big leagues, right? There you go. <laughs> might, 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 might take you know, a couple seasons, but... He could be the top lefty pitching prospect in baseball by 2020, the end of 25, if everything goes right. All right, write it down. Lindsay, Lindsay just guaranteed that. It's like the game time guarantee. Um, let's talk about Andy Pajes because Andy yeah. Pajes is an intriguing prospect to me. Uh, uh, last year at this time, we were looking at, you know, prospect lists and everything, and he had taken a fall on the Dodgers list. And there were some outlets even suggesting that not only was he no, long, no longer a center fielder, he might not even stick in right field defensively. He might be a DH or a first baseman. And uh, it seems like that has changed and and due to some very uh, conscious effort on his part. Yeah, so going into last season, he lost about 25 to 30 pounds. He went from 240 to, I, I want to say about 215 or so. He's listed now at 212, but those are almost never correct anymore. Yeah, my uh, but, driver's license says two ninety nine. <laughs> there and you that, go. That was true when I got it when I was sixteen. <laughs> but the big thing is, you can see what it did for him. Like, not only can he defensively, he can. He's not a plus runner. I mean, he's he's. It's probably just below average uh, speed. But last year, before he got hurt, he was in Double A the whole year. Uh, he played more center field than right or left, and it's something that I obviously they had been. They had said. 
He might have to come out of the outfield altogether. In this case, he was able to cover some in center field. The arm is still 70 grade. The injury that he had last season was a labrum tear to his non-throwing shoulder. So he's supposed to be back for spring training. The arm is perfectly fine. He's still not uh, in- incredibly accurate with that arm, but it's ridiculous arm strength. Uh, Dodgers fans who think about Yasiel Puig, uh, it's a very similar profile to that as far as fantastic power, a huge arm, going to run a little bit lower batting averages, going to be a little bit inaccurate with that arm, not the fastest runner, but that's a nice stylistic comparison to who Andy Pajes is, is a Yasiel Puig. So uh, he, he, the power plays everywhere. I think that's the big thing. And he's gotten better with the holes in his swing. You used to be able to get him uh, like kind of middle in, with uh, fastballs especially. Now that he's lost the weight, he's a little bit quicker, a little bit faster into the zone, and that hole magically closed up. So it's not just defensively where it helped him, but at the plate, losing the weight helped him have a little bit of a faster torso turn, a little bit of a faster swing, and uh, he batted 284 in that small sample before he got hurt last year. So... Did he sacrifice power by losing the weight? Because if you like, like you said, it's a small sample, 142 plate appearances in double A last year. But if you look at it, you know, he, he had four times as many doubles as homers. And most of his minor league career, it's been, you know, almost, almost even, roughly, you know, in fact, often more homers than doubles. Uh, did he turn into more of a doubles hitter or was that just a fluke of a small sample, you think? Uh, So looking at the numbers, the exit velocities are all similar to what they were the year before. The contact rate's better. I think some of that is just kind of random coincidence with a small sample size. And some of that is inherently when you're making more contact. In this case, he was at a 78% contact rate. When you're making more contact, uh, it's, it's logical for that for like your average exit velocity to tick down a little bit, but that 90th percentile and that max are still right there with what they were in 22. So he didn't lose any top end power, but the average does come down a little tiny bit when you make more contact. Okay. And then the on-base percentage took a huge jump. Uh, So did did he improve his plate discipline uh, along the way? So it's, uh, yes, he, he's never really been a huge kind of chase guy, but it felt like because he had more confidence about being able to turn on inside pitches, he was, he was better able to lay off of a good pitch and wait for a great pitch. And that's something where a lot of guys, when they move into double a, they struggle with the better command that opposing pitchers have. He really didn't struggle in that perspective. He was somebody who pretty quickly, I thought he's going to be in triple A sooner rather than later could be up at the major league level because the chase has never been bad, but he looked even better last year. Again, in a small sample, sometimes maybe, maybe it's just the vibes. He lost the weight. He just felt a lot better. And when you feel good, you play good. Like it could have been as simple as that. Yeah. And he is on the 40 man roster and the Dodgers, you know, often use, especially with what they have in the outfield right now. You know, it's not mm-hmm. crazy to think that Manuel Margot gets hurt and suddenly Andy Paul has the Dodgers fourth outfielder sometime this year. And defensively, he should be able to to cover either corner. Again, the arm is absolutely massive. He's not going to be, he can jump into center in a pinch. You're not going to want to play him there for a whole game, but he could do it if it was the eighth inning and you had to do one of those famous, uh, you know, double switches that happen so often on this team. Uh, it's, I would feel if it's the second half of the year, I'd feel a little bit better about it. He does only have a, a grand total of something like a what is it? I think it's um, 700 plate appearances in Double A, but he has four in Triple A. He has one game in Triple A, so he has the Double A experience. The new Andy Pajes, the slimmer Andy Pajes, only has 140 plate appearances in Double A. So uh, it he could do it. I think it's better if you could wait until the second half of the year. But if you needed them early, he probably can jump in there pretty early. Nice. Um, We're going to take one more break. We're going to come back and talk about the catching prospects and as many pitchers as we can fit in before we (laughs) run out of time. So uh, thanks again for making Locked On Dodgers your first listen every weekday morning. And please keep it Locked On Dodgers. Today's episode is brought to you by FanDuel. The NFL regular season is all done. We're heading into the playoffs, and there is still time to get in on the action with FanDuel, America's number one sports book. Right now, new customers get $150 in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. Remember, we used to say when you win a $5 bet, 
You don't even have to win anymore. You can be the worst better in the world and you still get your 150 bucks in bonus bets. I recommend you get better at betting so you can make more on that 150 bonus though. 150 bucks in bonus bets, win or lose. And the app is so easy to use. There are so many different ways to bet, like say, live same game parlays. You can find bets in the new Explore tab. You can make a parlay in the Parlay Hub, the best way, way to find popular parlays and more. So visit fanduel.com slash locked on and make your first bet a layup. FanDuel, official partner of the NFL. This episode is also brought to you by Logix. You know, on this show, we get a lot of in-depth analysis, sometimes some hot takes, right? Well, let me give you my hottest take of the day. The best lineup in LA right now is the lineup of auto loans at Logix. They start off at the top with my favorites, the proven and dependable new and used vehicle loans. You can count on these guys to give you low rates and save you big time bucks. Next up, they've got an exciting new rookie sensation in their electric vehicle loans with super low rates and flexible pay payment terms. Rounding out their lineup, they've got their auto refinancing loans with lease buyout loans uh, or and lease buyout loans. With these guys, you could lower your monthly payments and get on the road to owning your car, car faster. Look, I know it's a hot take, but seriously, no one can beat the lineup at Logix. Visit your local Logix branch right here in LA and let one of their amazing team members help you or just apply online in minutes at logixbanking.com. That's L-O-G-I-X banking.com. Hey, we're back, and uh, I'm almost done pushing buttons. Uh, thanks again for making Locked On Dodge your first listen every weekday morning. Remember to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, two 24-7 streaming channels on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network. Also, be sure to check out Locked On MLB Prospects, hosted by that guy with the beard next to me. I used to have a beard. Uh, Lindsey Crosby does a great show over there. He did a, a show last week all about Dodgers prospects. And so probably some stuff we won't talk about here. Go check that one out. Uh, I heard a little birdie told me that uh, it has done really well for him. A lot of Dodger fans have been over there. So let's make that even more. Go check out that episode when you're done with this one. Uh, and remember to become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. Uh, you can, it's just a few bucks a month. You can support this podcast and get text messages from us and text back and forth with us. It's a lot of fun. So check that out. And now jumping back into the episode, Lindsay, um, let's talk catchers. Uh, yeah. The Dodgers have two catchers who are among their top prospects. Diego Cartaya was their number one prospect. He took a fall uh, in most listings recently. Uh, last year, he really, really struggled. He he had 403 plate appearances, and he batted 189, had a 656 OPS. Really, really struggled at double A. The other one is Dalton Rushing, who, after being drafted uh, in 2022, he played in rookie ball very briefly, uh, but mostly with low A Ranch Cucamonga and batted like 9 million. Uh, but then <laughs> he moved up to high A Great Lakes this last season, and he struggled a little bit too. Much He did a lot better than Cartaya did. He had an 856 OPS, but uh, you know his batting average went from 424 with Ranch Cucamonga the year before to 228. Still great on base percentage, 404. Still a lot to like there. Let, let's talk first about Cartaya, I guess. Um, did 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 something go permanently wrong with Diego Cartaya, or is there still hope for him? So I think it's something where we're we're now into the second straight season. I guess we, we've we've been through two seasons now of Cartaya making like with the contact rate under seventy percent, and so the power is fantastic. The issue that he has is he chases too much, which is somewhat correctable, right? Like that's something that you can, for the most part, you can train a guy to get better at that. You can't ever truly fix it. But he also makes too little contact in the zone. So if you're going to swing and miss, I would rather you be swinging and missing at balls out of the strikes or at chasing stuff than swinging and missing at strikes. And it, it, it seems obvious, but for people who aren't, you know, super into prospects, it's typically easier to teach a guy to visually identify a breaking ball that's going to come go out of the zone and lay off of it than it is to teach a guy how to manipulate the barrel to hit a pitch in the strike zone that he can't hit. Uh, so that's what I'm a little bit worried about is his problems are in the strike zone, swinging and missing hittable pitches. And it there's, there's not any sort of common denominator. It's not like all elevated fastballs. It's not high velocity. It's just generalized zone contact rates being below where you'd like them. And so obviously something to pick up. 
I do think that obviously the power is there. The power is real. And uh, with the defense being where it is, I'm not sure where you go from here, right? Uh, it's He needs to get better behind the plate to stick every day, but he's also not hitting enough to go play a different position because first base has even higher offensive demands than catcher does. So probably best to let him repeat double A again and see if you could improve that contact right now because again, he's under 70% in two straight seasons. And if you can cut down the chase, you could bring that to closer to playable, just understanding he's probably going to always be a below average hitter with below average um, batting average, which is okay for a catcher. He also was three and a half years younger than the average double A player last year. He's and that's still, the flip side. Yeah. yeah he's, he's still very uh, young. He's 22, I think right now. Yeah. Right? He just turned 22 in September. So he'll play this whole, basically the whole entire minor league season coming up at age 22. And that's uh, why we're not writing him off yet. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and speaking of 22-year-old catchers, there's Dalton Rushing, who played last season as a 22-year-old. He'll be 23 next month. Um, and again, he took a step back offensively for sure. Uh, I think everybody expected him to take a step back because a 424 batting average and a 539 on base percentage, uh, even Barry Bonds at peak steroids didn't do that. <laughs> yeah, that's not that's that's not sustainable. It's kind of fueled by uh, you know batting average and balls in play and small sample size and all that kind of stuff. So the thing with rushing, I feel better about rushing than Kartaya because a lot of the under the hood stuff was much better. The chase rate, 15%, significantly below average. Contact percentage was like 75%. And so like you don't have a 228 batting average just from some bad luck. I mean, he, he did take a step back offensively, but I don't think it's as bad as we all thought it was because all of the underlying data from a plate discipline standpoint, from a hit tool standpoint, all of that data still tracks that he should be a good hitter. Now, if it happens again, like it did with Cartaya, that's where you have a little bit of concern. But under the hood, I mean, if if you told me that he batted 245 instead of 228, we're probably feeling, you're probably not, so not happy, but you don't feel as bad if he batted 250 than if he batted 228. And most prospects with those kind of chase numbers and contact numbers would bat much higher than 228 in that situation. So I do think there is some bad luck there. And the power is great, obviously. 90th percentile exit below 105. I mean, all of that stuff's there. The plate discipline again, the contact is there. It's just why didn't the batting average manifest? A couple different reasons, some bad luck, some, you know, some bad swings, some bad streaks. I think it's correctable still. Yeah, and I just can't get over the on-base percentage. 176 points higher than the batting average. <laughs> you very rarely see that. It's so strange. 72 then, walks and 381 plate appearances. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's, And then to 93 strikeouts. So I mean, he, he struck out around once a game, but, I mean, he walked almost as much as he struck out. Uh, it's it's a really odd slash line, and that kind of should be a little bit of, bit of an indicator that something was weird with that batting average, and it was some of that could be park factors, some of that could just be some bad luck, batting average and balls in play. He's not the fastest guy in the world, so he's going to run a lower BABIP anyway. Uh, it's I, I feel like that's more correctable than Diego Cartaya, simply because Cartaya's done it now for two straight years. Rushing had all of the stuff that said he should have had a much better batting average than he actually did. So now the question is, before we try to fit in some pitcher talk, uh, we have <laughs> Cartaya who needs to repeat double A and rushing who played last year at high A and is probably ready to move up to double A. Uh, there, teams are only allowed to have one catcher at a time in double A, right? Uh, like in the game? Like playing catcher, yes. Yeah. I mean, uh, rushing did play 23 games at first to 46 at catcher. Uh, Cartaya did DH 30 times and then, you know, caught like 68. You could conceivably work that out, but it feels like you have to either advance rushing, send Cartaya back. It's, it's a tough thing to fix. Sometimes this takes care of itself. Sometimes an injury, sometimes, a, you know, it'll work itself out, but you've got to figure out what to do here. And I don't, there's not an easy answer. You don't want to say send Cartaya backwards a level, but you've got to figure something out. It may be. Maybe you hold rushing back a little bit, extended spring, to see if Cartaya hits enough to go to AAA. I'm not sure. All right. All right. We've got like three minutes left. 
<laughs> tell, tell me which pitchers you're most excited about and why in the Dodgers farm system. Uh, Peyton Martin, the 17th rounder in 2022 out of high school. I think like he only pitched through early July, was shut down with, I think it was just innings management, but uh, 204 ERA in 12 starts, struck out like 48 guys in 39 innings. One of those guys does a lot of stuff, fastball, slider change. It all looks really good. I think he's a candidate to get a sweeper added to this profile. So he'll have a vertical breaking slider and a sweeper. And he'll give you all four directions and a couple different velocity bands. I like him a lot. Nick Frosso, uh, I think he's going to be a reliever. It's a really unique fastball. It's a lot of uh, it's a lot of work to make that pitch happen. The command's not there. Uh, Landon Knack, probably a starter, but the velocity, I'm amazed he hasn't been able to build more velocity because most of these pitchers here can do that. Um, River Ryan, I think, is the highest of ceiling of all of those pitchers you should see this year in the majors. I think he can stick in the rotation. He just doesn't have a lot of experience. He got into pitching a little bit later than the rest of the guys in that class, and that's why you've already seen seen Stone up and a lot of the other guys already come up, and River Ryan's behind all of them, but he has some of the best stuff with, with the fastball, the sweeper, the curveball, and the change. What about Kyle Hurt, speaking of change-ups? Uh, a guy, yeah, change-ups, big fastball, change-up, the slider curveball, that he, the stamina hasn't really been there for Kyle Hurt, and so... Unless he's able to build up into more of a starter's workload, not only in the season, but in individual outings, you're looking at, he could totally be a bulk reliever at the major league level who gets you all the way through through an order and then gives it up to somebody else. I don't know if you put him behind a Yamamoto, something like that for workload reasons, but he's not where he needs to be to be a starter yet, but he has the tools. And if he could build a little more stamina, he could do that. So starter stuff, just not starter stamina. Not starter depth yet. Yeah, starter stuff, not starter depth yet. But he can get there, though. And the changeup is a really good changeup. And uh, I guess as long as we're talking about good changeup, Gavin Stone, uh, do I like him more than everybody else in the world? Because I still love Gavin Stone, and I still expect big things. I think he could be the number three starter on this team, uh, possibly this year, if everything clicks right coming out of spring training. Uh, I know he didn't look great last year. He had like a 90 ERA and 31 innings. But the fastball change up, the slider, I like the cutter that he added, throwing right in there around 90 miles an hour, gives him a little more of a power look. If he can live in that 95, 96 range versus the 94, 95 he normally does, I think he could be a dude. He's just got to get better with the sequencing. He fell back on the change up way too much. Guy started to ignore the slider and he got whacked. So he has to be more confident. Listen to Will Smith, throw whatever he tells you to throw. Don't shake him off and mix up the pitches a little bit better and then keep the fastball in the zone. All right. Um, I think we've covered a lot here in 33 <laughs> minutes and uh, you know, we, we probably could have done three hours. We'll have to do this again sometime soon. Of course. Uh, I think this is the first time we've done a crossover. I know you and I have both been on locked on MLB together on a, a quiz show once. And uh, I believe I wiped the floor with you if I remember. Right. But uh, it was a Yankees quiz show and yeah, yeah. You're a lot older than me. And so you, you do a lot of that stuff better than I did. Yeah. Wow. You just slipped that right in. <laughs> Man. Uh, all right. Well, before uh, Lindsay tells everybody exactly how old I am, I guess let's wrap this up. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay, for being with me. Thank you, Everydayers, for being with us every weekday morning. We really appreciate that. If you're not an Everydayer, it's easy to become one. All you got to do is watch or listen every weekday morning. Then suddenly you're an Everydayer. You can also become a Locked On Dodgers insider by going to joinsubtext.com slash Locked On Dodgers. It's a lot of fun. It's just a few bucks a month. There's a free 14-day trial. Be sure to check out Locked On Sports Today and Locked On Sports Los Angeles, the two 24-7 streaming channels on YouTube from the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow us on Instagram and on Twitter at Locked On Dodgers. Vince is on Twitter at Vince Since 91. I'm on Twitter at Snydog. Lindsay's on Twitter at Crosby Baseball. Yes, I still call it Twitter. You can also email us, LockedOnDodgers at gmail.com, or you can send us a voicemail or a text message, 323-863-LOCK-5625. We are here every weekday morning, and we hope you'll be here with us. When you get in your car or sit on your couch, tell your smart device to play podcast Locked On Dodgers. And remember, you don't have to agree. You just have to listen. We'll talk to you on Monday.